so much for joining us this afternoon at Purple Crayons, Harold Play and the Seriousness of Play with Ross Ellenhorn, the founder and CEO of Ellenhorn. I'm just going to do a few housekeeping things before we go ahead and get started. So if you could keep yourself muted while Dr. Ellenhorn is talking, that would be really wonderful. This talk is going to be recorded, so if you don't want to be a part of that, just keep your camera off, but you can feel free to keep it on if you'd like. If you have any questions throughout the talk, you can throw those in the chat box and I'll be feeding those to Ross throughout the talk, as well as there'll also be some dedicated discussion time where you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. And without further ado, I pass it over to Dr. Ellenhorn. It's uh, really great to see so many people I know here. Um, it's also a little nerve wracking. But uh, so, you know, I'm going to give this talk about the importance of play. And I'm going to use this book, Harold and the Purple Crayon, to do that. Um, this is a pretty important book to me. Uh, it was read to me by my mother when, when I was younger. Um, and years later, when I was really sort of stuck in life, um, working as a social worker and kind of an institution, I read it to my son when he was three. And it really, I wish I could say it inspired me, but what it did is it brightened me. It made me feel as if this life that was in my hands that was supposed to be creative was becoming sort of a square person in a square cubicle making round people into squares. And it got me thinking more and more about this book. Um, Harold's tattooed on my leg. He's just part of my life. Um, but I'm fortunate enough now to uh, have HarperCollins want a, a book on this. So that I did so amazingly well with the sales of my last book that they've decided to give another chance. And that's a complete joke. Um, so this idea for this book, just to tell you very briefly, it's not all about play. Um, but it's really, if you've ever seen that book, The Tao of Pooh, it's about sort of learning Tao, uh, Buddhism uh, through Winnie the Pooh. This is about learning about this group of people called the Frankfurt School uh, through Harold and the Purple Crayon. And these were these guys, these German guys who came over to the United States, German Jewish guys, uh, one ended up at the new school, his name was Eric Fromm, one ended up at Brandeis, his name was Herbert Marcusa, and one ended up in LA, um, uh, Theodore Adorno. And they were really worried about this thing called conformity. They were worried about authoritarianism. Uh, and they were worried about this thing called alienation. These were these Marxist Freudian guys. And they had right, they had a right to be worried about this stuff. 1955 is when Harold came out. These guys were writing at that time. That's 10 years after the closing of Auschwitz. 1955 is also the year where McDonald's opened, where Coca-Cola started being put in cans so you mm -hmm. can mass produce it where Disneyland opened its gates, conformity, uniformity, these things were on the rise just after a period of time where people did some things that really were uniform that were terrifying. And so people were really worried about this loss of play in some ways, this loss of our humanity. And they thought about our humanity as this sort of thing in us that makes each of us unique. What Martin Luther King would call the sacredness of human personality. That when you're treated as a unit, instead of your own creative force, something sinful. Paul Tillich would call it sinful happens to you. And so the book's about that. And it's really also inspired by these kind of American contributors to this idea. One of them, one of them had a, a, a full religious uh, uh, um, uh, uh, beginning just 20 miles from here in Concord, Massachusetts. And that's Emerson and Thoreau and the transcendentalists who really believe that each of us is our own unique being and that you only can kind of find God through finding your unique being. And the other is this most profound of American art forms, which is jazz. It's probably the thing that, you, that America has produced that is the most important thing in music. And it is all about, again, this original immediate experience. It's all about play. And so these two thinkers and these two kind of worlds kind of help me in the book. So that gives you a picture of the book, but I'm really gonna talk about the play part of it a bit. So Harold and the Purple Crayon, I'm going to walk you through the book, by the way. It begins with a mess. 
it's just a bunch of scribbles. And he's trying to figure out how he's going to kind of move forward in life, what he's going to do next. So the first thing he does is he paints a moon, he draws a moon. And then he starts drawing these lines and the relationship between the lines begin to create a sense of space and dimension. So all of a sudden, the world's making sense. Just through these few slight lines and their distance between each other, the space between them begins to make sense. There's this uh, point in the Bible at the very beginning about coherence. And that's this moment where God divides the light from the dark. And at that moment is where we are able to kind of move forward. It's kind of a remarkable idea that we can only know the world through division, but it's a relationship between two things that give us a sense of distinction. So I can only know the chair across the room by its relationship to the wall. And I can only know the wall by its relationship to the chair. So they make themselves distinct, but they're also separate. That by the way, is what art is. Art is always this process of looking at the relationship between things. It is the human practice of looking at relationships. And so Harold begins as an artist. That's what he's doing. He's doing what artists do, which is to create his world by creating distinctness and originality on his own in an original world through division. So then he sets off on his walk. And he takes his purple crayon with him on this path he's built. Now he's moving forward. And that helps me introduce one of the main thinkers in this first part of this thing. And this is this British psychoanalyst by the name of D.W. Winnicott, very important thinker. And he's going to capture a lot of what I talk about. And he talked about this beautiful notion of going on being. What it means to be a self is to feel like there's a you behind you, a you now and a you in the future, and that there's continuity and coherence in you, not just the world. So Harold has now developed a coherent world. It's a sort of genesis. And now he's a coherent self who's going on, who's moving forward. But he doesn't really like that path. It's this straight path. And so he decides to cut a different path off that straight path. And that right there is the moment of play. To me, well, I actually think to me, and I think it's right, play is when you do something with something outside of yourself and you make it your own, you put your own original stamp on it. That play is the act of finding ply in something, finding movement in something that might feel stuck. That is the act of play. All play is taking something, bringing it into your own existence, and then making something out of it. That's really what I mean by play. And Harold is now doing that. He's playing. He's taking that long straight path, and he's making it into something else. And this is really central to, to jazz, of course, taking these melodies, these songs, and you're creating something absolutely brand new in what you do. And this is a profoundly important thing to be able to do, to take in the world around us and to feel connected to that world because we're creating something with that world around us. We're taking it in and we're doing something with it. And that's what Harold's about to do. Now, so far Harold's really been alone, right? Except for one thing, he drew that moon a while ago. He's not drawing it anymore and it's following him. And that moon stays with him without him ever drawing it again for the rest of the book. So there's this sturdy source in the sky watching over him. You really can't play and take the risk of play without feeling some sense of being held, being contained, having some sense of safety. And so this picture is actually false. That's the real picture. This is what Winnicott called being alone in the presence of other. When we play, we feel as if we're connected to something else in that moment. We have to feel that. And it's just part of play too. If you play with culture, you're, you're connecting to your ancestors. 
if you're connected to religion, you're connected to that religion. Play always involves this sense of an other with you. It's not an isolated thing, no matter what you do. And so play looks like this, it's this connection. Even if his back's turned to his mother, he's still in relationship with her. If she were to get a text right now, he would stop playing. It's that sense that someone's minding him that keeps him playing. And that transfers later on in life. This is why play is important. When we feel as if there's something above us that's greater than us, we're feeling alone in the presence of other as a group and all cultural activity is about feeling like you're part of something, you're connected to it by your interaction with it. So what's happening for that child when they're playing is they're practicing at being cultural. They're practicing at being a cultural being. How do I engage in the world where I take it in and do something with it and it makes sense to me and I feel connected to it. And they're also practicing at being social because at some point we don't have our parents and what we do is we walk around with what's called perceived social support which is this group of people we know will be there for us if there's a problem and we carry them around in our heads. So we invent them. They're there, but they're not really there. And social psychologists do all kinds of research on this. And when people don't, don't think about their, their social supports, just don't think about them. They, they face challenges are much harder, threats are much scarier, but these perceived social supports, we walk around with these alone in the presence of these others that can be miles away, it's all portable. Once we become adult, all of this is portable. Now, what makes it portable? How do we get to the place where we can actually walk through life holding people in our heads? It's magical in a way. Well, that kid doesn't really feel like his mother's separate from him. He feels like she's separate and he created her. He feels as if there is somebody there that he actually invented. And that's what we do in life when we carry people with us. We invent them in our heads when we need them. And that's what happens. We're capable now from our ability to play, to carry things around, to make our connections portable. They go with us where we go. And without play, we couldn't, we couldn't make that happen. So play provides us this ability to feel held without us having to be the people that are holding us in the room. And what that child is doing there is making each of those people seem alive to him. Because when we play, what we're doing is we're animating the world. And in many ways, Harold and the Purple Crayon isn't really about being original or play. It's about a person that brings the world to life. And that's what play does. Play makes things lively and excited. It makes you feel alive inside and it makes the world outside you feel alive. It's an act of animation. When you're not playing, you feel dead inside. When you're not playing, you feel like the world doesn't have life. Life comes about, your experience of life comes about through play. Play is the thing that gives things life. It gives things life to the toys. Children, when they're playing with their toys, they're animating those toys. They're making those toys into things that are alive. They're practicing again at how to bring life to things. And they're doing it on the hardest thing possible. They're not even doing it on a human being. They're doing it on a thing to practice this thing of seeing life in things. And in, in that process, they're feeling alive. And so what are they doing? They're using their imagination, their imagination to put life into things. If you go to an art museum and you feel alive while you're walking around, that's because you're playing. If you're in a great discussion with some people and you feel like you get who they are and you're feeling alive, that's because you're playing. These are the things that bring life to our existences. We don't actually go on being all the time. Often our lives feel dead and empty inside and it's play that brings that in. Coltrane's 
just a genius at articulating these ideas of improvisation and play. Um, he was a, just a profoundly spiritual guy. And he was talking all the time about this act of trying to get as close to what life is, the existence of life, the experience of life, and then something higher than us that you're getting to through play, through listening and connecting and changing things in the moment. There's a really important thinker, um, an anthropologist by the name of Gregory Bateson, uh, who believed that you can't see life unless you see the relationship between things. And by the way, he said that the people who uh, approximate nature in our society are the artists because they're always talking about relationships just at the beginning. You have to talk about the relationships because life doesn't exist in us. Life exists between us. Everything's ecology. So life isn't really a thing inside of us. It's between us. And to see that, you have to be in it. You can't look at it from afar. And you have to use your imagination. That life is only seen through imagination. It's not seen objectively. You can see somebody moving their arm, but that doesn't mean you're seeing life. When you're seeing life, you're engaging in this playful act of imagining. He called that creatura. To be in the creature world means to be in a world where you're in it, you're not observing it, and you're seeing those relationships, and you're alive, and you're seeing the life between things because your imagination is activated. So that's all going on in play. It's remarkable when you think about it. The amount of things that are going on to basically create a cultural being and a collaborative being a being that can have relationships with other people in order to invent. Like that's what humans do. It's, a, it's our special thing that we get together when we invent together. Now, Crockett Johnson has an interesting background. This is the guy that wrote Harold the Purple Crayon. Before he started writing children's books, he wrote for communist magazines. Communist magazines back then really meant anti-fascist magazines. These were people that are really worried about totalitarianism and authoritarianism in our culture. And this is kind of a prototype, an angry prototype for, uh, for Harold. But there's something about Crockett Johnson that interests me. And that's this dude. So Karl Marx had this really interesting idea. He said that what I'm describing as play, which is you take in something from the world from culture, from nature, you bring it in and you make something out of it. He said, that's the very essence of what makes us human. It's our species essence. So when a bird flies, it's feeling its birdness. When a human plays, they're feeling their essence as human beings. And that's why you feel alive. And that's why he was so disturbed when people couldn't control how they were creating their lives. Now, I know we're not supposed to talk about this dude anymore, but the fact is it's kind of a beautiful notion, right? That our essence exists in this act of play, this act of making something out of the world and bringing it into the world. And when it's taken away from us, we suffer. We disappear. This is what happens to Harold, remarkably so. So he's got this tree, he's got these apples, he's really interested in, in e eating at some point, they look really tasty to him. So he decides that he wants a dragon to guard the apples, but he loses track with the fact that he built that dragon, that the dragon is his drawing. So he gets scared of the dragon and his hand begins to shake in anxiety. He begins to back away and he falls into the sea of anxiety and he's underwater. It's the first time we lose track of Harold, he's underwater now. He's over his head. There's a word for that. It's called alienation. It's a Marxist term for when you lose touch with your inner life and you lose touch with your sense of the life in others. It is what the existence is without play. It's the sense that there's no me and me, there's no you and you. And when you're alienated, you begin to idolatrize. You begin to see things outside of you as more powerful than you 
you begin to follow them. So those newest shoes you want to buy, those newest jeans, the newest leader, all of those things are idolatry. And they come out of an alienated soul. A person who doesn't feel like they're strong enough to build their own life, to play, to create a life. And so they're looking outside of themselves. That's exactly what Harold does. He creates with his own powers. He forgets, I created that. And so when you think about some of the movements going on today of people that are kind of like blindly following leaders, these concerns about authoritarianism, it likely has to do with this issue of kind of I'm alienated, I'm disconnected. I don't, I don't feel like there's a me that's alive in me. And so I don't feel like there's a you that's alive in you. Well, Harold is playful enough and imaginative enough to get himself out of this. And this is why this book is so important to me, because I think this book is telling us what we, what we need in this era. It's not saying this is a definition of the self. It's saying in this era, we need this. For us to get ourselves out of these kinds of messes, we have to be able to be imaginative and playful. If you put imagination and play together, you get hope. They, uh, Snyder, which use the Snyder scale in social psychology basically says that hope is two things. One is a belief in yourself that you can make things happen, which is the attitude of play. And, you know, I can figure this out when I get there. I might have to make some maneuvers around it. And the other is you can think of alternative pathways when there's a problem. You can think over, around, above, whatever it is to get around the barrier. That's imagination. Imagination is the ability to take the world inside your head and play around with things until you figure out what to do. So hope is basically something birthed from play, from imagination and play, those capacities. And that's what happens for Harold. He figures out a way because he believes in himself enough to build that boat. Then he builds a mast, he starts sailing. And so another thing happens. The more he plays, the more he feels like he can control his life, what they call self-efficacy, mastery. And the more self-determined he becomes, I can pick myself up. And those things go with another term, which is dignity. That this idea of being able to continually pick yourself up in a way that doesn't conform or follow a leader, because there's, there's easy ways to pick yourself up from a mess. But to maintain your personhood every time you get up, that term for that is dignity. And to me, this is one of the really significant lessons of jazz is that you can get so far out there. It can get so confusing, but you bring yourself back and you never get up. You never give up and then you're back and then you're back again and you're back again. It's a music of dignity. Because you don't give up yourself. The thing you're maintaining throughout is yourself. It's not about survival of your body. It's the survival of yourself. This going on being, being. So Harold finally finds this, uh, this beach and he lands. And uh, he, he says, hey, man, this beach reminds me of picnic. So he decides to build, make a picnic. So now he's feeding himself. He makes nine of his favorite pies. And then he sits down to eat. And he eats a piece from every pie. Now, I'm gonna ask for just a slight bit of participation if you don't mind now. He's having a picnic there. He's looking full. To me, he still looks kind of unhappy. Can you figure out what's missing from this picture? People to eat with. People to eat with, yeah. He's picnicking alone. There's a very famous book uh, from when I was in college called Bowling Alone, which is about isolation in, in, in American culture. He's, he's picnicking alone. That's right. It's a very odd thing. A picnic is really a communal meal. That's what it, it is. A picnic means to pick something and bring the little thing that you picked and then you have a communal neat meal. Anything else missing from that picture? Other food besides the pies. That's true. 
Um, fork. What? He didn't draw himself a fork. He didn't draw himself a fork. Um, the purple crayon's missing. Sure. So it's the only time in the book that it goes missing. It's disappeared from the scene. Loneliness um, was rarely used. The, 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 the term or the idea of loneliness uh, isn't even mentioned in Robinson Crusoe as a problem. Um, loneliness uh, was barely mentioned in Shakespeare. Loneliness is a new phenomenon. It's also um, uh, very dangerous. Uh, it is as much a reason for heart disease as, as, as cholesterol or smoking. It has all, all kinds of uh, horrible effects on people's bodies. And that's because cortisol is running in your system because loneliness is the feeling you have that tells you you're in danger because you're outside the tribe. Now in societies before us, in traditional societies, there's all kinds of problems in those societies, including there wasn't, there was sort of a lack of a willingness to let people play and be original. There was all kinds of oppressive things going on, but there was a thing called mutual aid. And that meant that you were needed by the group. And if you didn't show up and you didn't add some mutual aid, you were kind of kicked out. And so even if you were grieving somebody, you knew you had to get back to the group at some point. So loneliness wasn't a problem in a lot of ways. And that's what the science shows now is that if you're lonely, you can walk with that. You can be in a crowd. You can be with your friends and still feel lonely. Therapy doesn't work to get rid of loneliness. Being with more people doesn't get, alone, get, get you to being less lonely. The only thing they found to make it so that you can be less lonely is engaged in something where there's mutual aid, where you're helping people and they're helping you. Because that's what your genetics are telling you you should be doing. So one of the great losses of being in a modern world is our ability to feel like we're always in mutual aid. There's a lot of great gains. There's a lot of beautiful things we get to do now that we couldn't do then. But the, the chance for regular mutual aid is gone and loneliness is up. So how does Harold deal with this loneliness? Well, he deals with it in two ways. One is he creates these characters. Now there's something really kind of interesting about these characters. In a typical children's book, he might have created a magical moose and a magical porcupine. Uh, but instead, he creates the inner lives of these animals. They're deserving and hungry. And the other thing is he creates mutual aid. They're going to clean up his mess, um, and he's going to give them the food. So both things he does here. But one of the most interesting things and in, in makes this book unique is the first thing he does is he tried to figure out what's going on inside of them. So he's deploying his play and his imagination to figure out what's going on inside of somebody else. Play, I'm gonna think about this, I'm gonna to try to figure it out. It's a very complicated thing to try to figure out the intent and experience of another and imagination. I gotta put them in my head to do that. And that's really what's going on here in this experience. For you to feel like people are holding you and that they're portable when you go around and that you feel safe, you have to feel like they're minding you, but you have to mind them. You have to think I'm in their head right now. That takes a significant amount of thinking and, and energy that is very imaginative. And the word for that is either, um, um, the main word for that is mentalization that they're using now, which is that, and, and it's really is a crowning achievement of our neocortex. It's built for this crazy thing where I can take in the world, I can consider what's going on in that world of others, I can take guesses at what's going on for them, imagine it, and then do something in response to them. And that comes from play. It comes from the ability to animate the world around you, not to see the world as things, but to animate it. And if you can't do that, if you can't feel held, if the world feels too chaotic and scary, there's another tendency, which is to not see the life in things. 
and this is a term that they were really worried about in 1955, we don't talk about it enough now, dehumanization. You don't have a tradition to hold you up. You don't have a sense of community. You feel stressed. You're not able to get it so that you can do the work of considering other people's experiences. And this is the danger of a world without play. We see people as things. And this is a central concern back then. It should be now. We don't talk about it enough. It was what Martin Luther King was worried about. Martin Buber was worried about. Paul Tillich was worried about. This act of dehumanizing others. So Harold's now has moved on from his, these friends he's made and he's beginning to want to get home. He's wanting to find his bedroom window so he can get home. So he starts building this mountain to climb to find it. And this gets us back to hope again. Hope when you hope for something, one thing happens. You make that thing more important than it was before you hoped for it. It becomes life important. And you notice that you're lacking it. So hope always takes the risk that you won't get the thing. And then you'll feel like your life is lacking in that thing. So hope is a risky, risky move. If you don't hope, you don't have to face these experiences of I don't have something in my life that makes my life full. And so to have hope and to move towards hope, you have to have this other thing called faith. Some belief in yourself that if things fall apart, if things don't work out, you'll still be able to pick yourself up. You're still strong enough if you're disappointed that you'd be able to pick yourself up. Another term people use for that is ontological security, which means the ability without others around for you to figure out a way to make meaning of your life, even at that point of disappointment. So Harold keeps looking for that window. He's looking around and then he falls. And so he's falling into this world of kind of despair and disappointment. You know, he wants to get home. He kind of values, it's really sweet watching Ed kiss his wife on Zoom. Um, so it, it, this light, this, this world of value, this thing that he values, this, he wants to get home and now he can't get home and he's falling into space. So of course, what does he do? He builds a balloon. And how does he do that? He does that with his imagination and his capacity to play and his growing sense of faith in himself, but he's still lost. He can't figure out where his home is and he's getting a little desperate to find it. And so he figures what he can do is just start building, draw his house, draw the outside of his house, land the balloon and everything will be good because he drew the outside of his house. But then he discovers that the windows of those house, the house aren't actually his windows. And he's doing something that these thinkers at his time were talking about, which is becoming outer directed. This is a very important book. It sold for 95 cents in Canada, it looks like. Very important book in the 1950s, one of the most important sociological books of the last century. And it's about this thing where we're becoming, we're losing touch with our inner lives and we're becoming outer focused, feeding ourselves constantly, looking for a way to be fed or to be like everybody else as the way to take care of ourselves. Being other focused instead of inner directed. And so Harold doesn't know what to do. So he just starts drawing windows. He's in this empty space and he's compulsively drawing windows. You know, one of the things that we know about that sense of loneliness and disconnection is that people will do anything not to feel it. And that a lot of what we call addiction and a lot of we talk we call about compulsive behaviors are people attempting to have some sense of being full, being full in their social connections. And so this obsessiveness that can happen, this is over and over again, trying to kind of build this thing, trying every pattern possible to get to this place of well-being because you feel empty and disconnected. Like you're homeless, there is no home. So he just keeps building these windows. He builds a whole city. The moon 
that source of safety that's been following him is now obstructed. The things he's building to try to find his, find his bedroom window, the sense of security that he feels is sort of outside of him is now being obstructed. And on the only page of the book, there's no Herald. There's so many buildings because he's just been building and building and building, looking for some way to satisfy himself. He's lost touch with play, the ability to make his life work. He's just automatically trying to kind of create a world. So he's lost. He can't think of where he is. And he doesn't know what to do, where to go. So he builds a new kind of figure, an authority figure, a policeman. And this is the end result when we feel as if we're so disconnected from our ability, from our species essence, from our ability to playfully engage in life, when it's sort of been taken from us, we begin to look at these outside, for these outside sources for answers. And we can hold on to them too tightly in ways that are dangerous. Theodore Adorno was so worried about this, he actually created this thing called the F scale, which was a way to kind of test people's personalities to see if they were authoritarian. But the main element in an, in an authoritarian personality is someone who doesn't play, who can't see ambiguity, who can't see flexibility, who can't handle uncertainty. And when you think about what happened in Washington in, in January, you really are seeing kind of people who are extremely certain about things, not flexible and following an authority. They feel like that authority will save their life. And that's where a non playful approach goes. So Harold's about to do it. He's about to follow the leader. And he says, nah, I'm not going to do it. He's, he's built himself up so much. He's like, this dude, he's just telling me the direction I was already going. He's really strong enough to avoid that process. And by avoiding that process, he comes back to himself and he comes back to play. Because he remembers something. He remembers it he's the master of this thing that he's been making this happen in relationship to all these connections his sense of his security and his connectedness has to do with whether he can draw whether he can keep creating and playing that it's his saving grace it is the place of his dignity and it's the place of his survival as a self is being able to continue to play and remarkably now He's not sort of framed by his, by his protectors. He's doing the framing. He's framing the moon. And so he draws his bed. He draws up the covers. And he drops off to sleep. And the crayon just sits there. I ask you to think of a children's book where the, the object that the child uses to make magic has no magic of its own. This is as much of an extension of Herald as any tool, any wand, any magic slippers, anything. It's just a crayon. It's Harold that's been doing this all along. And it's made it so that 
he could get from one place to the other and go on being. At points, he loses himself. He ends up in places of loneliness and isolation and alienation. We all do. And the best we can ask for in the modern world is, can we get ourselves back out? And that's what Harold does. And he does it by being original and playful and with dignity. There are a million other ways to deal with the anxiety of living in the modern world. You can follow a leader, you can conform, you can join some belief system and, and believe that it's completely unquestionable. All kinds of things you can do. You can get involved in drugs and alcohol. There's all kinds of ways. But in my mind, there's only one way to do it where you maintain yourself, and that is to maintain some sense of the value of play. It's what keeps your head above water. So thanks for listening. Um, I don't know, Lee, if there's questions or? There's nothing in the chat. Oh. Ross, I have, I have a couple of quick questions. Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> and that was terrific talk. It, it's a great demonstration of play, work as play, yeah. in, uh, in putting it together. But one was, are you familiar, uh, Gene Samville wrote a book on the psycho, um, the playground of psychoanalysis. I think it was about 30 years ago. Are you familiar with that? No. I'll, I'll send you a link to it. Um, the other question I have is about play with children now. And my experience with two teenagers is their play, if we don't step in, is all on screen. Mm -hmm. And I often think about as a kid, when you don't have all these options, you, you create things to do. Mm -hmm. And you get more involved in art and in imaginative play and all of this. And it's all kind of packaged on screen now. And I wonder what you think about that in terms of how it'll affect these generations. Yeah, well, it, it, I don't know the first thing that you brought up, but I'll tell you something that I'm completely convinced of is that um, the only thing that psychotherapy is, is um, an improvisational art form in which one person in the room is the focus of care. And that's what it is. And it's a very effective thing to be able to improvise with somebody and know that the one person in the room suffering is the topic of that improvisation. And I think that's a really effective way to help people. And um, it's very sad that that's not the definition we use. Instead, we talk about these best practices you can learn on a weekend. And supposedly these are these magic tools. They're not purple crayons, they're magic wands. You know, I got my DBT wand, I've got my CBT wand. These things are, these things become these tools that are stronger than us, our own humanity. There's a famous uh, thinker by the name of Ivan Illich, and he talked about tools for conviviality. And that meant that what he's talking about is a world where the tools run our lives. And where our profession is becoming increasing that way, instead of recognizing that this profession came out of the humanities, it did not come out of medicine. It came out of a belief that you could practice the humanities in an office and help us somebody with their suffering. And so it, it began as play. It, it is not coincidental that it is jazz-like. You, you open your door, a person walks in, you don't know what the melody is gonna be and you gotta figure it out together. And don't get me started on group therapy because that's just like lots of improv, right? Um, and then, yeah, I don't know what to think of it. I know the kids are now watching other kids play with their toys on the internet. It just sounds just horrific. Um, partly because, you know, a toy, uh, the tactile experience of a toy, and, and, the, and, and, and the, the internet is not convivial in the sense that you can't do stuff with the thing any way you want. And play is the ability to kind of pick something up and look at it and move it around and throw it across the room, maybe try to hurt it. It's all those things. And none of those things can happen in virtual environments. So it's worrisome to me. Um, it's, it really is. It, it, but it's also just worrisome to me that we live in a culture that doesn't permit play. I mean, there really isn't a lot that's permitted. And we live in a culture where play is appropriated for selling things. 
So commercialism has come in and just taken hold of play. I mean, Disney started started that, but everything, everything that we used to sort of do on our own is now kind of owned by Netflix and all these other places, right? It's just sort of, you know, Disney said they were the happiest place on earth. Unbelievable that they could do that. But that, but that, that kind of movement, yeah, yeah. It it's been a long run. It's not just the internet. It's been a long run away from play, you know. Thanks. So we do have a question in the chat from Natasha and she asks, how is this related to your wonderful talk about hope to FFI in October? It would be great to see a linkage between what you just presented and what you presented then about loss of hope. Oh, they all mash together. I'm too lazy to write like separate talks for each thing. Um, uh, so the question is about how does it, the one I gave in October already? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, everything that I'm thinking about lately ends up with one thing, which is psychological flexibility, that that is the goal. And hope is part of the tool chest of psychological flexibility because hope is the thing that drives you through uncertainty. That's what it is. There's no hope when there's no certain, when there's certainty that it doesn't exist in certainty. So when things are uncertain, hope drives you through in a flexible way. Okay. Cause the other way to get to uncertainty is to say, Oh, I'll just follow this leader person or I'll just conform or I'll do, but hope is the one that's a playful way to get to uncertainty. Right. And if you ever want to read somebody who just talks about this all the time, read Martin Luther King. He's always talking about this hope as this redemptive thing that gets you through. It is getting you through something where you don't, you don't know what it's going to be like on the other side, but it gets you through there. Um, and so uh, I think all my talks are about sort of that, which is just sort of all the tools, all the resources we need. But I also think, like I said in this talk, that hope is really the result of play, that that's where children learn how to hope. And when we're hoping, we're being, we're being in a way playful. Because when you hope, remember you're saying, I can, I can get around that thing. That's a playful thought. Because play is always, can I change or move or change that thing? Um, so yeah, I, I, I basically just, uh, you know, I, in other talks I talk about um, the last thing I want for my clients is for them to be normal. That's just like, like I, I cannot stand spending more than five minutes with a normal person. I just, they're just a drag. What I want is someone who's flexible. Lots of ideas, lots of things going on, right? Uh, and, and is flexible with me. Doesn't see me in one way or another. Is able to kind of move around and figure things out. That's, to me, what I hope for myself in my life is this psychological flexibility, you know? And I think that that comes from play, you know? This, this thing that children do, it's like they're preparing to be cultural beings. They're preparing to be part of a culture and then they enter a totally fucked up culture. This is the sad thing. They're preparing to go to art museums and to make art and to be engaged in that kind of way. And then it all becomes things that you buy in the gift shop. You know, it's just really sad because we're, the, the raising of them might be right but the culture is not prepared for them. I, do we are we allowed to call out or we can yeah yeah i i just i mean i was trained as a developmental psychologist uh -huh. so play is very close to my heart yeah and i watched my children play when they were younger <clears throat> i'm just thinking for example my my daughter and her son now my daughter's a mother but she I, we'd have a cardboard box and she was maybe you know eight or so her youngest brother was maybe three and they would be she'd make it into a car and yeah. he would get in the car and ride pretend to ride it you know they made like a steering yeah. wheel and this and that and it was like the it, it was hours and hours and i'm thinking that you know with all this stuff with the the digital stuff the computers all this these gadgets where everything is like supplied there isn't that much room for 
creativity. And I also believe hands-on, you know, children need to use their hands and their bodies. That's so important. We're not just minds, we're also bodies. So I think that that the two have to be used and, and outdoors, you know, playing outdoors. Um, like my grandson, they live up in the country somewhere. And when I'm there, I just go out on a walk with him and he's, this is his, his backyard, the forest. It's his, it's his, it's his play, you know, it, it, it's his world of play. I mean, from nature to this and that. And I just think we're losing that art of being able to play adults as well as children. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I think that's right. And I, I think we also got to remind ourselves how valuable it is. To me, there's nothing more valuable. It's, it's our essence that we're losing. It's our humanity that we're losing because it's what makes us most human. Like I said, a bird flying is in, in touch with its birdness. A human playing is in touch with their humanness. I'm just sure of it. Um, and what a remarkable thing that you can look at a doll and make it alive. What a profound thing to be able to do. Like of all the animal kingdom that you can look at this doll and it becomes alive. And that we're not supplying that to kids because everything comes animated. Everything comes ready. There's no ability to practice at that thing. You know, of that, this like, I can bring life to life. In life, the experience of life, it's something we bring with us. It doesn't come to us. For me to see you as human requires me to see you as human. For me to see myself as human, to feel my own life requires me doing that. And so it's terrifying if we're losing the touch with that because it means we just become empty robots. And that's what, these, that's what these people were worried about. They didn't even know about AI or computers or anything. That's what these folks were worried about, that we were heading in that direction. And, um, you know, you know, I was in um, New York in 1982 and people were really, really upset about this one thing that was gonna happen. And it was that um, on street level, in a regular store, storefront, they were gonna put in this place called Banana Republic. This was like this big deal, right? Now that's, the conformity is everywhere. It, it's, just, it's just everywhere. You don't even think about it anymore. The, the tsunami hit and we just don't even think about it, you know? Um, and, you know, and, and food that is just always the same and all of that stuff, it's really, um, and at the same time, there's all this cool shit the kids are doing with gender and ethnicity and it's freaking playful. It's really cool. So there is this other movement going on where the new generation is doing these interesting things about identity and all of that, that is joyful and interesting and, and, and fights oppression because it doesn't stay in one place. It's flexible thinking. So there's all that hope in that too. There's all that kind of, it's amazing how play can come back, how it can raise its head again, you know? And just to throw it out there as somebody who has a two-year-old and a three-year-old, they still love boxes. They have access to the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse <laughs> on TV. They still love boxes. Um, and I think that, it, you know, Ross's discussion about cultural stuff is really the, the thing that's really tough. Like my kids have been socially isolated because of COVID. So this is sort of a bubble that's far away from other things that have happened in recent years. But like they don't have other kids saying, hey, did you watch this? They mm -hmm. just are playing. Um, yeah. So it's kind of an interesting uh, little thing that's going on right now with these young kids who have never been to or have in a very long time not spent a lot of time with other children and had that kind of cultural thing on them. They love to play, I think, in a way that's really authentic and um, in the traditional sense. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm, I'm 59 years old. And if I hear these two words together, I get super excited refrigerator box. If I hear refrigerator box, I just, I just, all of a sudden my spirit just goes way up. Like 
the refrigerator box was like the greatest thing for a parent to bring home. You know, Terry Shapiro's agreeing. Yeah. yeah. It's like paper and a purple crayon. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, hi, Ross. Um, hey, Tom. Hi, uh, great talk, great talk. You know, uh, I keep on thinking, uh, maybe I'm just going down the wrong end, but you, we've all, or most, many of us have had uh, the young adolescent man, usually a man, uh, or, or a little adolescent boy, where you get into your room, sent to you by his parents, obviously everything is stuck, and he can't talk, he can't feel, there is no play. It is we've all faced that dilemma. It is so painful. I used to call these people the bone crushers. You have yeah. to sit in the room and just sitting. It's a slow process because you, you, you can't be empathetic without, without taking on what is awful pain. Uh, and it, it seems to me that it, it's, it's um, to do this kind of work, to get play moving when you yourself are in most of your day, you have these kinds of clients in an alienated space, is, uh, is mind boggling. We all have known this. Uh, yeah. But I can't see taking, but, but, but I think I have a hint from what you're talking about. It's common sense, but also it's well grounded, what you're saying, is that we as therapists have to have societies of mutual aid in order to help us. Yeah. Uh, and that's more, and that's more, more than, than, than supervisors. And I, 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 sometimes I wish I could get around with people and they would tell stories about about the bone crushers they faced, yeah. about the problems in play. These, these, uh, and, and, and in lieu of that, I think what people hold on to is their own uh, glorified objects in, in the intellectualization of various uh, CBT programs. That, you know, that, that works well and yeah. good, but it's, 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 it's the only kind of crayon a person has when you're, when you're, when you're faced with, or it feels that way, when you're faced with the kind of bone crushing lack of play and lifelessness, roboticness that we feel in many of our patients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tom, I, I don't know all the answers to that. I, I do know that. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I do know that I, 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 I really appreciate the stuff that's coming out of Chicago on loneliness. And then uh, I really believe that loneliness is the feeling of not being connected to mutual aid. And I really think that that's what it is. It's not loneliness. It's not being alone. It's not, it's not being connected to mutual aid. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and that's all sort of gone. You know, we've got to recreate it now. But there are no more guilds. There are no more, you know, any of that stuff. You know, um, AA is the closest thing. You know, <laughs> but that story about the kid being—I just want to say something. The story about the kid being sent to his room. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Sendak hung out with Crockett Johnson. Uh, they, they, uh, oh, really? Ralph huh. and Crockett Johnson were married. They're they were children books writers, and they and they kind of helped Sendak become famous, become big. And um, where the wild things are is a remarkable story about play and imagination. Because uh, the mom, you know, the mom sends him to bed without his dinner. Uh -huh. And then the book is really about the mom in some ways, because he's he's off there and he's just like, screw you. I'm going to just imagine this other place. Right. Because you're not giving me dinner. And then he sort of gets bored because he's partying too much. He's kind of hung over. You know, he's just been with these guys for so long. And then he smells her dinner. Uh -huh. So she was pissed, but she was going to make him dinner, you know. And so and he kind of knew that. So it's all about that alone in the presence of other. It's like the kid's allowed to go off, but he kind of knows the parent's going to be there at the end, right? And he wouldn't have been able to imagine the wild things if he didn't trust her. He wouldn't be able to go that far, right? Take that risk of kind of imagining that way if he didn't know that he was probably going to eat that night. Um, and when he returns, what's the last line? And, and the food was still hot. And the editors told Sendak, hot's dangerous. Children won't like hot. And he fought for it. Because hot meant she was prepared for him when he got back, not like this warm meal and he gets back and was just sort of sitting there. So it's all about that holding and how holding allows us to be imaginative. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. I'm thinking about how important it is for you know parents and caregivers to, to model that flexibility and imagination and following what the child, you know, mentalizing really what the child might be feeling, you know, and I'm thinking of an example now, when I did research back in the 90s, I, I, I had a, as part of my study, a gift giving segment where I gave mothers who were substance abusing mothers, you know, wrapped up little gifts to give to their toddlers. And 
and have you know just present this gift to the ch toddler and open you know open it up help them whatever and what was interesting was that many of these toddlers were so intrigued with the ribbons and the wrapping paper and not the little book inside and i saw mothers who would go with that and you know play with the child with the ribbon and wrapping paper and others who insisted no this is what you have to look at and would insist they look at the book yeah yeah so it was so telling and i was thinking like that could really stifle curiosity and play when children's natural inclinations are thwarted by parents who never had a chance to play themselves and they themselves were you know yep. brought up in very tight refined and flexible ways yeah now, now you're born to do what that child's doing you're not born to play with the pre-made toy because what right. you're born to do is learn how to invent in a collaborative way that's what makes you human Right. So your whole being is, if I'm going to develop, I got to play with this ribbon. Play with it, look at it, see different angles. That's, that's you becoming a cultural being. And so we're taking that from the child when we take that away, because that, that's really what play is. Play is this thing that gets you to the point where you can be a cultural being. And, and it gets you to the point where you can hold people in your head and feel safe. And, and that's the just one of the most beautiful things humans do. What's that? The enthusiasm that the, the baby, the child, the toddler would feel yeah. is, 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 is like stifled. It's like, it could be a beautiful thing playing with this ribbon. It could really develop into something very playful and imaginative. And the child learns a different lesson. You can't do it this way, the right. way you really want to. You have to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. 